Uh, well, thank you for having me. Um, so today I'm going to talk about transverse groups, and this uh, this talk is based on three preprints with uh, Dick Canary and Tengren Zhang. Uh, so two are on the archive, and then the third will be on the archive uh, today plus Epsilon. Uh, and it's a little unclear if Epsilon is like days, weeks, uh, months, or years, but probably closer to, to weeks. Um, <laughs> but we'll see. Uh, so, so as, as Tengren talked about, Anasov groups are um, sort of like higher rank analogs of convex co-compact groups in uh, the isometry group of HN. Uh, there's also these, these relatively Anasov groups, which I guess haven't really made too much of an appearance in, uh, except for the last talk. Uh, so those are like the analogs of geometrically finite groups. And so these, these transverse groups are the higher rank analog, or one higher rank analog, of just discrete subgroups of the isometry group of HN. And I should also mention, so we really like the word transverse, or at least I do, and I don't know about you two. He does too. <laughs> But uh, people may also know these by uh, regular uh, antipodal. But that would be a, a longer talk title. So, um, okay, let me see what else. Okay, so then I also, I just want to talk about G equals PGL uh, DR. Um, although many, some of the results are true for general semi-simple Lie groups. And then actually my main goal today like isn't really to even talk about like theorems, but just more um, a perspective. So, uh, so introduce a perspective uh, for studying transverse groups. Okay. But uh, that will come in a little bit. First, I just want to do some definitions. And actually, first, I want to start out by just talking about uh, dynamics on flag manifolds. So this was either, uh, I, think, I think maybe it was mostly implicit in other people's talks in the mini courses. So I'm just going to go through this. So I'm going to suppose uh, theta which is going to be a list of uh, integers inside uh, 1 through d minus 1. And then I'm also going to let theta opposite be just uh, d minus k, where k is in theta. And then uh, f of theta is the partial flags Um, that just have these dimensions. And so there's also like a lot of uh, letters, so D, K, and M already. So I apologize in advance if I start reusing them accidentally. Uh, so just let me know if you see an issue. Okay. And then we also can define the partial um, uh, flag manifold associated to theta op. Okay, so then let's suppose uh, we have a sequence of elements in PGL uh, dr, uh, where we have uh, gaps between the singular values, and so uh, there's a gap between the k and uh, k plus 1 singular value that goes to infinity uh, for all k in theta. Uh, and then what you can say is, so what this means is that you have like a contraction on the partial flag manifold. And so, so what, it, what it means is there exists a subsequence, so I don't think I've used i before, uh, and uh, F plus in this partial flag manifold and F minus in the opposite one uh, where uh, G N I of F converges to F plus 
uh, for all f in the flag manifold uh, with f transverse to uh, f minus. So that's sort of like a, a convergence action type deal. Um, or the, I think Tangren called it the strongly dynamics preserving in his mini course. Well, I guess there's no preserving, but it's strongly dynamics or something. Um, okay, so that's, that's the dynamics. And so this, the entire talk is really about this type of dynamics. Uh, and so the next thing, two uh, definitions. Okay, so there's three definitions. So a group is P theta uh, divergent uh, if uh, that property holds up there. Sigma K over sigma K plus one of GN goes to infinity. Uh, for all sequences in your group, uh, distinct, and then for all k and theta. Uh, so that's what it means to be divergent. People also call this regular. Um, so that's A. Uh, B, uh, in this case, uh, so in this case, you can define a limit set, and so it's, I guess it's slightly different than the limit sets we saw in the Zariski dense cases uh, in the mini courses. And so the limit set of the group is all F plus in uh, the partial flag manifold where there exists uh, GN in gamma and there exists F minus in uh, the opposite flag manifold. Um, where GN F converges to F plus uh, for all um, F transverse to F minus. Yeah. When you say C <laughs> K of GN, if I mean sigma K plus one of GN, you mean sigma K of if I did sigma K I. You by the best sigma k i plus one. Uh, yeah. I guess I dropped the indices, and now it's just k and theta. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know. It's kind of annoying because I just needed to write k one yeah. through k m to define f theta, and then I don't really care about the k i's anymore. Okay. Yeah. And then oh yeah, the other thing. I mean, I don't know, but you know, we're looking at this opposite flag manifold just so we can talk about transversality. So we're pairing the complementary dimensional spaces and seeing if they're transverse. Okay. Any questions so far? I mean, that's a special case. Of right. It yeah. should be the same yeah. as, yeah, it's the same uh, in the Zariski dense case. In the Zariski dense case, it's exactly the same, yeah. But it's like, I think, if I remember correctly from the mini course, it's, it was obtained by taking the closure of the attracting fixed points. But they're actually, I mean, like, you could have a P theta divergent group that has no loxodromic, P theta loxodromic elements. Yeah. But in the Zariski dense case, they coincide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry if uh, what I said sort of suggested the opposite it's yeah so so the yeah maybe I should also say the definition in the risky dense case about like the attracting fixed points yeah it may not give you anything because there may not be any loxodromic elements I mean in the cases we consider there are and they're actually the same but uh, anyways uh, other questions about anything in the non-elementary case there is always loxodromy you can define it the same way not it doesn't have to be the risky dense just the non-elementary I guess so, yeah. I guess it depends how you define non-elementary. <laughs> yeah. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. But anyway, so yeah, so we have this good dynamics at least on subsequences, and then we have a good limit set from these dynamics, and then the C is, uh, uh, I'll say in this case again. So I just mean uh, you're still p theta divergent. Uh, gamma is p theta uh, transverse. Uh, it, oh shoot! In this case, uh, 
when uh, theta equals theta opposite. Uh, so so there, there isn't really much cost to like uh, considering the case where theta and theta opposite are the are the same. So you're closed under taking d minus the index. Um, and so I want to now. So for the rest of the talk, we're just going to consider this case. Um, but I, I do need this limit set where it's not not symmetric for like one statement later. So uh, so gamma is p theta transverse if uh, distinct uh, flags in the limit set are transverse. So, I, I, and one reason I think we like the word transverse for defining these groups is because you know, transverse groups are, have transverse limit sets, like, uh, and it's just linear algebra, linear algebra transverse. Um, okay. And then I want to, so before, I want, I'll give some examples, but first I want to just like uh, mention one more dynamical property about these. So this, I guess this observation is due to Kapovich, Lieb, uh, and uh, Porti. Uh, and so what it says is that um, uh, lemma, oh no, I already wrote the observation. Uh, so if gamma is p theta transverse, then uh, gamma acts on the limit set as a convergence group. Um, and so this will be the one proof I give in the talk uh, because it's just one line long. Uh, so, so let's just, let, let's, let's see how this goes. So let's uh, fix uh, gn in uh, gamma distinct. Uh, so by uh, one, section one, there exists a subsequence in, uh, there exists a subsequence and uh, f plus minus in the partial flag variety uh, where uh, g n of i of f converges to f plus for all f transverse to f minus. Uh, but then by the transversality assumption that this just means, for instance, that, uh, I mean, if you're just looking at the limit set, this is satisfied when you're in the limit set, but not equal to f minus. Sorry, I'm writing in this corner. Um, so the transversality turns this north-south type dynamics into a convergence group action. Um, and that's why maybe you think of these as an analogy of discrete subgroups of isom uh, h d. OK, so any questions? So that's the definition. OK, so then I have to do this. Um, yeah. Um, in the definition of p theta transverse, yep. assume p theta divergence. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If it is a residence, uh, does, uh, does p theta divergence uh, implies uh, this, what, what are the, in the Zareski dance case, what are the relationship between? Are those two notions equivalent? Uh, uh, I don't think so. Yeah. Isn't it broken? I'm not sure, yeah. Uh, okay, so. <laughs> okay, so next up, I just want to give some examples. So, um, so first, I guess, the, I guess, yeah, this is a theorem. 
And I honestly have no idea who first wrote it down. Maybe it's just, uh, I mean, it's probably implicit in, in earlier papers, but let's just say KLP, Kapovich Lee Porty. Uh, and so, uh, I wrote, yeah, so, if, so gamma is P theta and Ossov. I mean, this, this is uh, if, it, if and only if it's uh, P theta transverse, uh, word hyperbolic, and uh, uh, there exists an uh, equivariant uh, homeo from the Gromov boundary to the limit set. So the P theta transverse represent their groups contain the uh, Nosov ones, which is more structure. Uh, another example is uh, if we have a discrete subgroup of the isometry group of HD, uh, discrete, um, and I guess HD is real hyperbolic uh, D space. So uh, this is another example. So we can identify, I mean, we can identify HD with the unit ball. Uh, in a uh, affine chart of projective space, and then we can identify the isometry group with uh, PO uh, 1D. I guess I'll push this all the way up. Um, I guess I'll go in order. Uh, if we do that, so then uh, the distance between a base point and a G of P, well, it turns out it's like pretty much just log of uh, sigma 1 over sigma 2 of G, which is equal uh, to log of sigma D over sigma D plus 1 of G. Uh, and so if you're discrete all the way up there, uh, that tells you that uh, gamma is P uh, 1 D minus 1 divergent. Uh, and you also can just write down this limit set. And uh, so the limit set in the one, oh shoot, no, D uh, and D, uh, the limit set of uh, lines in uh, D planes is just uh, the pairs uh, P and H, where P is in the hyperbolic uh, limit set, and uh, H is equal to the uh, tangent space of the boundary. Again, realizing it as the open ball. And so we get some uh, picture like this. We have a point maybe in the limit set, and then we have this uh, hyperplane through it. Uh, so that's the limit set. And then it's, it's uh, if you pick another point, Q, and another hyperplane, uh, Q is not an H, and uh, um, this hyperplane doesn't contain P, et cetera. So uh, we see that gamma is P1 D minus 1 transverse. Ah, D. Uh, yeah. Um, OK. So I want to do one more example. Uh, and so Tangren talked about this in his talk, these uh, projectively visible groups. And so yeah, yep, yep, exactly. Yep, exactly right. Um, yeah, so Tangren talked about these uh, projectively visible 
uh, groups. So this is a just a properly convex domain. So it's a bounded open convex subset of an affine chart. So it's like the unit ball, except it could be more general. And then we have uh, gamma in the automorphism group. So that's just G in PGL uh, dr, where G omega is equal to omega. So it's the group of projective automorphisms that preserve omega. And then in Tengren's talk, he, he introduced this notion of projectively uh, visible. And so I don't, should I remind what, I'll say what it is, and maybe I won't write it. So, so he defined the, the limit set in this case, and then it's projectively visible if uh, every point in the limit set is a C1 point of the boundary, and if you pick two points in the limit set, the line segment joining them is inside the domain, so it's not in the boundary. Uh, this is convex, so it's either in the boundary or inside. And so in this case, uh, you can show that then gamma is uh, P1, uh, now it's D minus 1 transverse, and uh, I essentially we'll just write the exact same thing again. So the limit set is, is exactly, uh, well, it's exactly the same, except I replace HD with omega. So you look at points in the limit set, and then you look at uh, the hyperplane being just the tangent space. And so this gives you another example of uh, transverse groups. So any questions? So these are all the examples I'm going to do. But uh, I guess it's important to note, I mean, these groups don't have to be uh, finitely generated. Um, they include the Anasov, include the relatively Anasov. Um, they could have unipotence. Okay. What? You have D and D minus one. Oh yeah. So in this case, uh, I, there had to be a plus or minus one somewhere. Yeah. 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 So. <laughs> yeah. HD sits in a. It's one of these. Yeah. 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 Uh, any other questions? Okay. So then, I want to talk about like. Uh, this perspective that we have on these things. And so that will go on this board, and then I think that board will be taken for the rest of the talk. So uh, the perspective uh, for these. And so the perspective is pretty much that this is the only example. And so let me ex explain what that means. Um, and so this is a proposition in our first paper. Uh, and it says if uh, gamma, so I'm only doing the PGL case, uh, is P theta transverse. Ugh, terrible board work. Uh, then, beautiful. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I am beautiful. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, then there exists some other number, uh, D naught. Uh, there exists some omega in uh, the associated projective space, and uh, there exists gamma in the automorphism group uh, such that three things. Oh, I already used gamma. Gamma not. Uh, yeah, gamma not inside the automorphism group is uh, projectively visible. Um, so it's projectively visible. Uh, two, there exists rho 
from gamma naught to gamma onto uh, homomorphism uh, with a finite kernel and then three there exists a row equivariant uh, homeo uh, from the the limit set in the projective geometry sense uh, to uh, the limit set in the transverse group sense so uh, we have a model of our group that acts on one of these properly convex domains uh, and then the, the boundary dynamics is exactly the same. And so, I mean, the reason why maybe this is helpful, or it's hel it was helpful for us, I think, is that uh, um, you can draw pictures in Omega. And actually, this, this projectively visible uh, condition, uh, it says that the, the, the geometry of, of uh, this domain is pretty close to being hyperbolic uh, when you're looking at, say, points in the orbit of the group. Um, and then I, mean, I should also say, so this word visible, there's this notion of visibility in cat zero spaces. And so this is sort of inspired by that. Okay, so any questions so far? Yeah. Uh, I mean, you, you sort of just take a representation that's compatible with the parabolic, that sends the parabolic to a, into the fixed point of a line, and then you, uh, you take the symmetric tensor, and so that's it. Okay. Yeah. So if we take uh, theta equals 1 and d minus 1, then we take the second symmetric tensor? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Did you have a relationship between d and d0? Oh, yeah, yeah. So it's just, there, I mean, if you, know, if you know theta, you can actually write down the representation exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. I have a comment. I think I realized that Benoit provided an example of this risky dense group, which is not transverse. So you should take a convex projective surface with a type 1 cusp, and this will probably give you the right example. Okay. Can I ask? Uh, uh, it, yeah. It, 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 I find it strange that the representation goes from gamma naught to gamma. Is that my, like, uh, um, you also could do it the other way, yeah. Yeah, and we actually, I mean, I don't know, our construction is like, we do construct it the other way, and then we observe that like, uh, it's pretty much uh, uh, injective on the group. I, yeah. But it doesn't, uh, I mean, you don't, you can't take the representation of PGL into, <laughs> PGL itself into. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, that's how, yeah, that's how the proof works, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Is it in Omega properly convex? Uh, yeah, Omega is properly convex, yeah. Yep. Other questions? Okay, so then I also want to mention just one more thing related to this. I wish I had small enough writing to put this all on the two boards there, but I don't. Um, and so this is, uh, I, want, I want to define two other objects associated to this uh, projectively visible group. So let's, let's look at C Omega, uh, Gamma Naught. This is the convex uh, hall of... Uh, the limit set in the domain, and then uh, let's let g omega of gamma naught. So how did I write this? This is uh, all v, and so so there's a there's a metric on omega, the Hilbert metric, and so there's a unit tangent bundle. Uh, it doesn't really matter the definition, so I'm not going to bother with it. But there's just a unit tangent bundle. There's a geodesic flow. Uh, so there's a dynamical system, and so you can look at all the unit tangent vectors that uh, uh, limit to the limit set. And so I'll draw a picture instead of defining v plus or v minus. So we have our convex domain, we have a uh, unit tangent vector v, v, and then we have and one endpoint in the boundary and another endpoint in the boundary. Uh, and so that's sort of the picture. So this gives us a space that's invariant under flowing along 
these lines. I should also say, for people not familiar with the Hilbert metric, these straight lines are just geodesics. So the, the Hilbert metric, I think, is a completely, is super beautiful. It's like, geodesics are just straight lines, but of course it's, a, it's also a Finsler metric, so it's not Riemannian, so that's kind of annoying. But, uh, but we do have geodesics or straight lines. Um, okay, so then this gives us a flow space, and this is a, a metric space. So we can put the Hilbert metric of omega on that. And so there's this theorem. Uh, and so, okay, so I'm going to, this is, I, I don't know, this is like roughly in, uh, uh, so now I'm just going to use the abbreviations from Tengren's talk. Uh, G, D, G, K, exact, so I assume everyone has a perfect memory of everything written in all the mini courses, but you can look in your notes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so you have perfect memory. Uh, all my sampling says that this is correct. Uh, so, uh, so these transverse groups, they contain the Anasov ones. And so what happens in the Anasov case? So if gamma is P theta Anasov, then uh, A, this convex hull of this, uh, this group gamma naught with the uh, Hilbert metric of omega, uh, this is a QI to just gamma naught. So we've sort of recovered the Cayley graph. Uh, and then B, if you quotient out by gamma naught of this flow space, this is uh, homeomorphic or, um, or maybe isomorphic in some sense to the, the geodesic flow space. Of uh, gamma, of gamma. Uh, so in the Anasov case, we sort of recover the objects that everyone uses to study Anasov representations. Uh, but then in the transverse case, you know, maybe this isn't uh, Gromov hyperbolic, but it's close to Gromov hyperbolic. And maybe this isn't like an Anasov flow, but it's uh, pretty close. So uh, with some definition of pretty close. Okay, so this is the perspective that we used in these three papers to uh, study transverse groups. And it was mostly just constructing a geometry they act on and constructing a flow space um, where you can also draw like nice pictures. And so then I'm just gonna like list some results uh, that we proved in these papers. Um, so I think it's, this board is the last one, last survivor, oldest survivor I should say. So now it's gone. Um. That's kind of a dark joke for those of us overseas. <laughs> 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 okay, <laughs> so let me mention some applications. So the first thing that, or, so this is the uh, second paper. Uh, so this is uh, Patterson uh, Sullivan theory, and so. I was sort of preparing this, and there's so many people in the room who have done things about Patterson-Sullivan measures that I don't want to say anything specific because then I have to cite their stuff, and it would take me like all 50 minutes to sort of explain the relationships between it. So I'm just going to say we study Patterson-Sullivan theory. Uh, and so the sort of the point is, you know, we have this flow space, we have, a, we have this metric space, and so you can define shadows in terms of the metric space, and then it's sort of a... Uh, I don't, I don't know, I don't want to undersell our work, but really, like, once you're in this perspective, uh, you almost can just repeat uh, Sullivan's stuff with just a little, just a tiny bit more complications. Uh, and so it's kind of, uh, you know, you start with this transverse group, which sits inside some semi-simple Lie group. Like, how do you think about it? Well, you sort of construct this projective model of it and then uh, pull back your measures to that model and start thinking about that. And then you, you know, read all the papers on Patterson-Sullivan measure theory and see what works and what doesn't work. Uh, so, so we have this Patterson-Sullivan measure theory. And so let me just, so this is incredibly vague. Like I said, I, there's many partially overlapping results and I don't want to explain it. I don't want to spend my 50 minutes talking about that, but I'm happy to talk about it uh, afterwards. Um, so what we proved is for transverse groups, uh, uh, there is a ergodic 
uh, dichotomy. And so uh, also, you know, I think in the last like 15 minutes of my talk, I can just be super vague, sort of more for experts in the beginning, maybe it's more for grad students. I'm not even going to say what the ergodic dichotom dichotomy is. You have 25 minutes. I have 25 minutes. Okay, well that's too bad because I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> 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 okay, then I need to slow down. Uh, uh, but it's actually interesting because yesterday there was this dichotomy based on rank that was uh, discussed during the mini courses. And actually our dichotomy is completely, I mean, it's, it's different. Uh, so in the Nasov case, uh, the group always acts ergodically on the boundary and boundary cross boundary when you have the right patterson solved measures. Uh, in the transverse group case, it's just like hyperbolic geometry. The discrete subgroup doesn't always act co or ergodically with, with respect to the patterson solved measures. And so our, our dichotomy doesn't have anything to do with rank or uh, these directional limit sets. Instead, it's just about whether the group acts ergodically on the boundary and boundary cross boundary. So it's like more like the classical dichotomy in hyperbolic geometry. OK, so that's, that's one thing we did. Uh, what's the next thing? Uh, so then the, the next theorem. So this is the uh, today plus epsilon result. Uh, and what that says is uh, for uh, relatively, not spelled that way, uh, relatively Anasov groups, uh, Patterson, Solvin measures uh, are ergodic. So you're always in the ergodic side of the dichotomy. Um, so we proved that, and that will appear shortly. Uh, oh no! I think okay. I think the one on top is now the. <laughs> this is a mistake. Uh. Uh, yeah. So like I said, there's. I mean, there's tons of overlapping results. Like pretty much half the room could raise their hand. So I just don't want to. Uh, talk about it, but uh, uh, lots of other results about Patterson-Sullivan measures. I should also point out, so one of the reasons why, you know, for people who've studied this in this risky dense case, like you already have shadow lemmas and stuff, so you might ask why are we doing this? And so in, in you know, in this, in this uh, transverse setting, we're, uh, we're not uh, looking at the Zariski dense case. Um, so it doesn't really fall into a lot of the older papers. I mean, it's worse than that, too, because you can easily have non-semi-simple Zariski closure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's worse than the Nasov case, where, yeah, this non-semi-simple Zariski closure is kind of a pain. Um, okay, so that's uh, the first set of results. So now, I don't know if people can see this in the shadows. Uh, I don't know. Uh, so the next thing I want to talk about is uh, Hausdorff dimension. And so it's kind of too bad because I think the next mini course lecture will also talk about this in the Nasov case. And so this is, so I'll try to say something intelligent here. Uh, so this is the theorem, or one of the theorems from the 2022 paper. Uh, and so you're looking at one sort of particular case for theta. And so it's 1 Q D minus Q uh, D minus 1. And uh, gamma is P theta transverse. And then if, and so there's two conditions. I mean, it seems really strong, but this, you know, there are examples that, that satisfy this. So if the second singular value equals the third, uh, equals all the way to the qth. So you have this long list of singular values that coincide for all G and gamma. Um, and then two, um, okay, now we're going to, uh, yeah, fine. Uh, so you all, so this is a condition introduced, uh, for Nasov groups called hyperconvexity. Uh, so you take two, uh, lines in your limit set, add them together with a D minus Q plane, and this should be direct. Uh, for all uh, F1, F2, F3 in the limit set 
uh, distinct. Okay. Oh, no, that goes to the middle, I think. And this goes to the front. Uh, and then so under these conditions, so in the Nossoff case, uh, and I think this will be the topic of the next mini course talk, uh, it was shown that these, not by us, uh, it was shown that these, uh, uh, these tell you, you can compute the Hausdorff dimension then. And so uh, then, so I'll give references in a second. Uh, then Hausdorff dimension of the limit set, except now uh, it's not the full limit set, it's just the uh, lines, and it's also not the full limit set, it's the conical limit set of uh, gamma. This is equal to a, a simple root entropy, which is uh, taking a limb soup of 1 over r, a log uh, of the elements in your group, where log of sigma 1 over sigma 2 of g is uh, less than r. So this counting result it gives you the Hausdorff dimension of the conical limit set. And so then there's lots of notes uh, about this. So a Nossoff case uh, due to, uh, can I write, no, I don't think Tangren used this abbreviation. Uh, Posetti uh, Samburino. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Uh, okay, the Nossoff case was, like I mentioned, already established. Uh, also, uh, the, the isometry group case, or the isometry group of HD case, uh, where Q is uh, uh, D. Uh, this was done by um, Bishop Jones a while ago. Oh, also in the Nossoff case, the conical limit set is everything. Uh, and then the other things, maybe I won't write this down, Hausdorff dimension, that's just relative to any Riemannian metric on the flag manifold. So it's just the usual thing you'd think. Uh, conical limit set, that's just in the convergence group action sense. Uh, so we know this acts as a convergence group on the limit set. Uh, it's in projective space, right? Yeah, so this is in projective space. Yeah, so this is the one limit set. Yeah, yeah. and then, so I want to just... It's, it, it's the same as in, as in the flag manifold, because the map is a smooth map. preserves how it's structured. Oh. Yeah, is that true? Yeah. Um. <laughs> Okay. Right. It's true. Yeah. Okay. Let me. Let me just. I just want to mention the the proof idea here. So, uh, I have ten minutes now. I guess I'm so confused. What? Seventeen. Seventeen. Wow. Okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> okay. So so I can't I can't explain the proof of either our results or the Nossov case result or the Bishop Jones result in 17 minutes. Uh, well, maybe I could try, but it'd be a disaster. Uh, so I, so I want to just like mention in, in the ISOM of HD case, like how, the, the sort of vague idea of the proof uh, works by uh, constructing uh, a tree uh, with uh, vertices uh, in gamma, uh, in a gamma orbit in uh, the hyperbolic plane, whose uh, whose ends approximate uh, the limit set, and so that's. I mean, the proof is a lot more involved than just the sentence. Um, but if you were convex scope compact, you would just take an embedding in the Cayley graph. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. This, oh, I should mention this. So in this, you know, already in uh, the ISOM of HD case, uh, you know, if you're only if you've only seen the proof in the convex co-compact case, 
in hyperbolic geometry, it's, it's, you know, it's, still, it's still a deep result, but it's not that bad. You just look at the Patterson-Solvin measures and prove their Hausdorff measures. Uh, in the discrete case in ISOM HD, the, the Patterson-Solvin measures are not Hausdorff measures. And so uh, this Bishop-Jones approach up, that I mentioned up there about constructing a tree, they use the tree to construct a measure on the boundary and then use that to get a lower bound on the Hausdorff dimension. Um, and the measure is not group invariant, which is the really weirdest thing about it, the proof. Yeah, it's a really cool proof. I mean, they, they, they do this like by hand construction of a tree uh, that really approximates the limit set, and then they what have. What is Q here? You have a Q in the and then there is nothing uh, Q in the statement about Hausdorff dimension. Ah, theta. In theta, there is a one Q D minus Q D minus one. What is oh, Q? who is Q? Is she asking in theta? It's, it's just an index. So it, it turns out like Q is. Uh, uh, but there is no nothing. Uh, but Q it's near in, in the, the first number. Hmm? In the second assumption, really. In the second assumption. So there oh, has to be uh, some. In ISOM HD, no D thing. is D plus one, and D is D equal to D minus one. Yeah, it's a mess. <laughs> <laughs> That's, it's again this confusion about ISOM HD lying in SOD plus one. Uh -huh. So if theta is everything, so can you replace that column by any root or? Uh, yeah, no, there's, yeah, so this is just for the one limit set. Uh, but then if you have, yeah, so it, like, for instance, it turns out for Hitchin representations, you can apply this theorem to any of the wedge, wedge products. And for any simple rule, so you are going to have one then for Hitchin representations. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, uh, so again, I guess these, these assumptions are not, they're not, you know, they were sort of created in the Nasov case by PZ, PSW. Uh, so so they're, they're responsible for these hypotheses or some of approximation of these hypotheses. But what, the, but what they show in their papers in the Nasov case, these two assumptions are, I think they actually consider something a little more general. Uh, uh, it implies that you have a conformal action on the boundary. And so it's very believable the Hausdorff dimension should be that counting function. Yeah, so that's the idea. It's like, I mean, you have the, all these agreement of singular values that tells you the actions, con that tells you have, you have like a conformal action on something. And then this condition tells you this conformal action is actually on the limit side. I mean, it's kind of confusing, and you're probably better off asking. Well, you're better off probably listening to the next mini course. Sorry, can you have q equals one, or is it? Sorry. Uh, yeah, I guess we want q bigger than one. Yeah, 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 or bigger, bigger. Yeah, q should be bigger or equal to two. Yeah. So we have, yeah. Other questions? Yeah. So we the uh, Isom HD case is not contained in the no, their Q is the minus one. Yeah, it's like the Isom HD is in dimension D plus one. Yes. Yeah. But then D. Maybe if you said it was Isom HR. So that the one. And that if you think of Isom HR, it's one, <laughs> it's one R in Isom within. PSL D, which is where D is R plus one, and then <coughs> it traces through. Yeah. Yeah, there's the same dimension where I saw HD is, is in PGL D plus one. Yeah. Well, actually, why don't you just make it I saw HD minus one? <sighs> it's too late. I'm not going to pull down the board. <laughs> <laughs> Stand up for yourself, Andy. The board is only coming down when it, it gets <laughs> removed. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm still confused. The set of roots. Uh, theta, in that case, does that have two elements now? Yeah, I guess we just have two elements, yeah, yeah. So what is the second condition? Uh, well, one. yeah, so in the hyperbola case, it would be D plus one minus D. Because that's, D is equal to D plus one. Yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah, any other questions? Okay, so let me go back to what I wrote, uh, I guess, at the top of the board now. So it says uh, in, in the isometry, in the, in the hyperbolic case, Bishop Jones, they construct a tree with vertices uh, in an orbit in the in, uh, hyperbolic space whose endpoints approximate the limit set. And so they use this construction to bound the house surf dimension from below, which is the tricky part. Uh, so you might guess how our proof works. And so uh, uh, in, our, in our proof, uh, we construct a tree uh, with uh, vertices 
uh, in uh, the orbit of our projective model inside omega that approximates the limit set. Uh, and so the proof, I mean, the proof is, you know, the proof has the same general idea, but a lot of the details have to be different because you don't have global hyperbolicity. You sort of have a weaker hyperbolicity in this projectively visible case. But I mean, I don't know. This was one example where I really like this perspective. I think I think you could take our construction and transfer transfer it into the symmetric space, but it would be like a, a complete nightmare. Uh, I mean, maybe that's the way to do it: is to do this exam, do this, do it here, and then never tell anyone about it, and just convert all your proofs into the symmetric space where it's not understandable. Uh, maybe that's the best move. Uh, <laughs> But uh, but it, but in our case, it's like you have this you have this geometry, and it just works like so nicely. Uh, you just have enough hyperbolicity to sort of adapt their argument and prove this Hausdorff dimension. I mean, you can also take this as evidence that uh, it's time to start <laughs> thinking about other homogeneous spaces than the symmetric space. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah, and uh, yeah. Maybe that's another point is that uh, uh, when we do this model here, this projective model. It's this visible word that tells it's sort of weakly hyperbolic. Uh, but if you look at the action on the symmetric space, you have all these flats, and you know people have come up with ways to get around that. But uh, you know it's kind of technical these these diamonds and all this other stuff. So Morse geodesics. Um, I mean, I would say all that stuff is the shadow of of this somehow. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, the action on the appropriate space. Yeah. yeah. Because I mean, if this wasn't around, I don't think the theory would exist. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds really good. So I agree. <laughs> I also think we can agree with each other. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And then I also want to mention entropy rigidity. So, uh, so this is sort of actually the the starting point of our uh, work, and then we sort of realized as we were doing this this proof that with the right perspective, everything could also work for these transverse groups, and so. Let me just mention this result, or this uh, extension from the uh, classical Nasov case now, right? I think it's been around long enough that we can call the Nasov groups the classical theory. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I think we should call them old Nasov. Senior. <laughs> Um, okay, so this is about these cusp Hitchin representations, which were introduced in the last talk. Except I'm also, I don't, do I want to write this down? Yeah, maybe I'll just write this. So, so, the, so if you remember in the last talk, cusp Hitchins, they're uh, they're these representations where there exists a positive uh, equivariant map. Of, or, sorry, gamma. <laughs> uh, there's a Fuchsian group, and there's a positive equivariant map, or <laughs> I could have just written this down. There's a representation of a Fuchsian group, and there's a positive equivariant map of the limit set into the full flag manifold. So that's these cusp Hitchin representations. They were in the last talk, so maybe I won't write it down again. But I will write this. So we allow uh, gamma uh, infinitely generated. And so this, this uh, so gamma is just isomorphic to some Fuchsian group. It doesn't have to be a lattice or convex co-compact or geometrically finite. Uh, I'm just going to use this board. I don't know if this is the... Yeah, it is the last board. Okay. Um, so, uh, so that's the setting. And so these, these groups are transverse relative to theta equaling everything. Um, and then what is the theorem? So uh, one, the... Uh, simple root entropy is less than or equal to 1 uh, for all k equal to 1 to d minus 1. And then with equality, uh, if and only if uh, gamma um, um, I guess I should have actually written down what cusp Hitchin is, comes from a lattice. So is the image of a lattice. Uh, so so if, you have, if you start with the Fuchsian group that's not a lattice, you're always going to get strictly less than one. <sighs> yeah, thanks. 
with the quality, which, yeah, okay, there's, you're right, yeah, I need, I need finitely generated for this to be true, so let me just erase it, yeah, yeah, that's exactly right, yeah, yeah, no, you're exactly right, okay, so two, uh, so I figured I would have less time at this point, so I wasn't going to write down any definitions, uh, I probably still won't, uh, so you have this uh, symmetric space entropy, and that's less than or equal to 1 as well when you normalize it to make it that true. Um, and then 3, so this is, uh, um, yeah, so this is the part. If gamma is finitely generated, uh, then here we go. So A, a quality in 1, if and only if. Uh, gamma uh, comes from a lattice in uh, PSL 2R. I'm not writing, I'm writing it this way in this talk. So you only can get a qual uh, in the finally generated case, you get a quality if and only if it's a lattice. Um, and then B, uh, a quality in Two, uh, if and only if there exists irreducible uh, representation tau uh, from PSL 2R into PSL uh, DR, uh, where uh, gamma inside the image is a lattice. And so in particular, it comes from a lattice. So it's a representation of a lattice. Um, so that's the theorem. So let me push that up to the top. In A is in B? What? I'm confused. Which one's the same thing as A? No, this is, yeah, because remember, uh, yeah, you always get one for lattices. Right, no, but you also want irreducible images of lattices. Uh, no, but it doesn't have to be, uh, yeah, it doesn't have to sit inside a representation of, um, you just mean gamma is abstractly isomorphic to a lattice and PSL2R? Yeah, that's what I mean, At, yeah, so it's, yeah, I guess I should have just written down the definition of cusp pitching again, but it's, what? Two minutes, okay. So it's, uh, gamma is the image of a positive representation of a lattice. That's what it means in A. And then in B... I'm being a moron, sorry. Again. Yeah. So in B, it's also a positive representation of a lattice, but it also sits inside an irreducible image. Okay, and then, yeah, so this, is, this theorem is known in the Nosov case. So that's the note. Uh, uh, a Nosov case... Uh, and maybe this will be talked about in the next talk as well. Uh, and I mean, the proof is the proof of our result is sort of similar now. I mean, we we sort of have to develop all the facts they use about an Ossov groups for. Well, I mean, we we sort of develop them for transverse groups and then restrict to this case of cusp pitch and, and so then just like in their work. Uh, the simple root uh, entropy is actually equal to the Hausdorff dimension of the limit set in the, the Grassmannian of k-planes, and positivity tells you that's less than 1. And so that's, the, that's sort of the connection between the Hausdorff dimension and this entropy rigidity. And then 2, uh, just like in the Nosov case, this, this actually comes from a, a strict convexity result for entropy, uh, but in our case, you can't just use the thermodynamic, well, okay, yeah, in this case, we use the thermodynamical formalism developed in the last talk. Uh, that's what allows us to prove the rigidity result in two. Uh, yeah, so I think, I, yeah, I think you said I had two minutes, three minutes ago, so I should stop. Non-lattice case, because... It wasn't previously known that even in the Anasov non-lattice case, the Hausdorff dimension was strictly less than one, unless I'm wrong. 
And that comes from an entropy, entropy gap formula, which you didn't discuss. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, maybe the, yeah, I think in their case, an Ossoff case plus, plus uh, a gamma is uh, closed, isomorphic to closed surface group. So, yeah. So now that you're starting to understand some of this more general case, uh, bearish density, yes or no? <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's the answer. Yeah. They're quasi isomeric batting. No, no, but are they regular antipodal? Don't use those words. Come on. <laughs> or what? Transverse? <laughs> oh, I have no idea. Are they transverse? I mean, quasi isometric embedding is the wrong condition in the symmetric space, right? Well, everything's a limit of convex co compact. In the it's not clear. What was the conic set in the previous? What? What was the conic set and then the... Uh, yeah, the conical limit set in the... Um, in the... the uh, house surface dimension result, it's just... It's, yeah, so the group acts as a convergence group. And so it's the conical limit set in that sense. What? It's the conical limit set in that sense. In the convergence group sense. Yeah. And then actually, so with the projective model, uh, you don't even have to use the convergence group perspective. So the, con the conical uh, limit set, actually, of, the, of uh, the, limit, the theta limit set, it's the image of the conical limit set of this, and the conical limit set of this is actually just in the geodesic sense, uh, where there exists a, a sequence in your orbit that shadows the geodesic limiting to that point. So, uh, and that's the definition in hyperbolic geometry. Yeah. Yeah. Can but you could them? also define the conical limits to just the G or the gamma in higher rank space. Mm -hmm. uh, inside A plus, you can just say that the A plus mm -hmm. orbit is recurrent, uh, and then uh, that gives the same definition in this special case. So you can just define the conical limits. Yeah, that's true. In yeah. The yeah. Other, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. C can that um, conical limit set really have different Hausdorff dimension than the full limit set? Yeah, I think already. I mean, I'm not an expert in the hype. This like even in rank one. Yeah, yeah. In rank yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah. Even for Foxian yeah. groups. Infinitely generated, though? Yeah, infinitely yeah. generated folks yeah. groups, yeah. Infinitely generated. <laughs> okay, perhaps uh, the questions and comments can be postponed <laughs> <laughs> to, um, uh, to the uh, uh, coffee break. Um, so uh, we are going to meet again. Uh, we are going to meet again in uh, uh, twelve minutes. Uh, the next talk is at four fifteen. But before that, we have to uh, thank Andy again. <laughs>